Today's luncheon is sponsored by Bowden, Bowden Construction. Their sponsorship includes the opportunity to uh, speak to the group about their organization. This time I'd like to uh, have uh, Nick Gonzalez, branch manager of Bowden Construction, to come up and take a couple minutes. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Mike. It's uh, good to see you up here at the podium again. <laughs> so, good job. Um, uh, as Mike said, I am Nick Gonzalez, General Manager of Bowton Construction, born and raised uh, right here in Tri-Cities, uh, graduated at WSU. Any Kook fans in the, in the room today? Hey, Kook. Uh, one guy over here booed, so all you guys <laughs> will just clap. Go over to this table. Uh, we're pleased to be today's sponsor. Um, a little bit about Bowton Construction. We've been providing pre-construction services, design build, GCCM, BIM modeling, traditional construction services in the Tri-Cities for over 40 years now. Uh, we really take pride in our community and remain committed to giving back uh, by staying involved with organizations such as the Cancer Center, uh, the Cadillac Foundation, Rotary, Leadership Tri-Cities, Young Life, Tri-Dec, and of course uh, here at the Chamber. We've done many projects over the years uh, specializing in healthcare, K through 12 construction, higher education, laboratories, and really compl any complex project in a facility that needs to remain open uh, at the same time construction is going on. Uh, recently, uh, we just completed uh, WSU's new nursing school facility, which was in conjunction with Cadillac Regional Medical Center's uh, HealthPlex. And if you're not familiar with where this building is, it's the old yellow and orange Rite Aid building um, on Lee Boulevard in Richland. So. Um, it looks a lot different and a lot better now, so stop, swing by and uh, drive by and see that facility. It looks great. We're in the final stages of completing Lincoln Elementary School in Kennewick, and we are getting prepared to begin construction on the much-anticipated Tri-City Airport expansion here this summer. We pride ourselves on being leaders in, in eastern Washington for lean construction. For those of you not familiar with lean, lean is creating a culture of continuous improvement with the goal of eliminating waste while increasing value to the customer. Uh, simply put, Lean is creating more value for our customers while using fewer resources. And what we've found over the last few years that we've in, implemented Lean processes is we've found uh, that we're completing our projects quicker, smoother workflows, higher quality, which in turn e equates less cost to the end user. So with that, again, uh, thank you for having us today. We're excited um, to be today's sponsor and uh, more excited to hear from the public facilities districts today. During lunch. Thank you, Nick, and thanks to Bowden Construction for their involvement with the uh, Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for sponsoring today's luncheon. Today we have what's hot in the community. Uh, this is a report from Eric Van Winkle, board chair of Giza Carousel of Dreams. Eric. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I apologize for my parents have been out the site today, but uh, we really appreciate that. So um, thank you for your patience with our project as well. Uh, it's coming along very nicely, and um, I, I'm here to report that the building that you see out in Southridge Park, uh, our Southridge Sports Complex with our partners, Kennewick, is coming along nicely. If you look in the middle of that park, you'll see a spaceship-looking thing. It's about 10,000 square foot. It's probably about 75% done. It is a world-class facility, I can tell you that. But as of today, starting on Monday, the real fun began in that <clears throat> we are assembling that 103-year-old carousel inside that building and we'd be done on about the first of next month so about the next seven or eight days i invite each one of you to come out there and peek in the window it's a construction site so we got to follow the rules but once you see this thing you'll see what we're up what, what what we're up to and why we're doing this this is world-class art that you can ride touch and feel 
another destination that this community sadly needs, right? We need this type of thing badly. Uh, it's coming along nicely, and we really appreciate your help. Board members, if you raise your hands today, thank you for all of your effort. We got a crew of about 18 on the board, and then there's a, probably another 75 volunteers. We got 15 of them out there today building this thing. Um, see you on the carousel this summer. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I don't want him to. I don't want him to go without really talking a little bit about what opportunities are there for you out here. So if you just spend a couple seconds on what opportunities are for people. Well, thank you for that. Um, we are at that stage. Uh, somebody asked you, are you done? No, we're never done. This is an ongoing project. Um, our partnership with the city of Kennewick, we're, we're, we plan for the 100-year plan. Um, so as we move forward, we set some extremely lofty goals. When we set out to do this a couple of years ago, we rebuilt this board. We wanted to walk in with no debt and 100 grand in the bank. Uh, those are extraordinary goals, and we're, go we're going to get very, very close to that. We are not done, and I tell you what, a year in, we're not going to be done. But um, we're going to make it. We're within a $3.6 million project. We're easily within a 5% of that. Um, it's as simple as this. We have opportunities from a $200 tile to commemorate your bird or your cat or your friend or your neighbor, all the way up to a horses or 15, 25, and 35. We've got rounding boards for 10K apiece all the way up to partners at maybe a quarter million dollars. So there's a little bit of everything out there. Um, those are available. And yes, we're going to stick with our goal. We'd like to be at zero debt when we open the door. And we do need your help with that. Thank you. The Tri-Cities Regional Chamber of Commerce is pleased to announce Community First Bank as the March Outstanding Member of the Month. The Ward and Recognition Committee selected Community First Bank based on the commitment to the regional chamber through 17 years of membership and support of the primary sponsorship of the, biz of the Business Expo in 2013 and for their ongoing and upcoming sponsorship of 2014 and 2015 events. Additionally, Com Community First Bank is actively involved in the regional chamber programs, clubs including Learn Groups, Ambassador Club, the Golf Committee, and others. Accepting award for Community First Bank is Patty Jensen Key, Assistant Vice President. Patty. There. Uh, thank you, Patty, and thank you for Community First Bank for all they do for the Chamber. Uh, at this time, I'd like to take the opportunity and my pleasure to introduce Renee Vasquez, Chair of the Board of Ch uh, Directors, to lead us through the remainder of the program. Renee. Thank you very much, Mike. Hello, everybody. Well, it's uh, one of the best sounds uh, a chairperson can hear for the chamber is the sound of everyone networking before we start the meeting. It's just a great sound. I'm not sure if you all realize that we're uh, the fifth largest chamber in the state of Washington. We're kind of closing in on Spokane, so I want to applaud everybody for that. You know, we have a great chamber thing going on here in the Tri-Cities. So uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome um, uh, Elizabeth Holth, we'd like to present uh, some membership plaques for our new members. Elizabeth? Hi there. We're excited to announce some of our newest chamber members today. If I call your name, please join Renee over here and we'll take a group photo. So we have Jamie Richard with Advocare, Laura Turrell with Merrill Lynch, Mary Lynn Heinen with Advanced Realty Group, Karen Baker with Vista Hermosa Foundation, Curtis Byrne with Crown Moving Company, and Kevin Westfall with Ready Ice. Please join me in welcoming these new chamber members. Great job, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. And welcome to all of our new chamber members. Glad to have you with us. So at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce our panel for uh, today's discussion. Um, first, we have John Givens. And John has a unique perspective working with the Pacific, uh, excuse me, Public Facilities District boards. He currently sits on three of them. John is the treasurer of public, uh, Kennewick Public Facilities District, represents the Kennewick Public Facilities District, and the city of Kennewick on the Tri-Cities Public, there, you, you can really hear me now, if I get closer to the mic. <laughs> Uh, facilities Board, and additionally represents Eastern Washington on both the Board and Executive Committee of the Washington State Association of Public Facilities Districts. Next we have Dr. Fred Robb. 
He is uh, the head of uh, LIGO Hanford Observatory and a member of the professional staff of the California Institute of Technology. He serves as the president of the Richland Public Facilities District and a member of Tri-City Regional Public Facilities District. Next we have Matt Watkins. Uh, Matt is president of the Tri-Cities Public Facilities District in addition to serving uh, as the president of the Tri-Cities Public Facilities District. Uh, Matt also serves as Pasco's mayor. Matt was elected to, this, to the Pasco City Council in 2004 and was elected as mayor in 2010. A lifelong Tri-Cityan, Matt holds a Bachelor of Arts in Social Science from Washington State University and currently works as a software engineer for Lockheed Martin Information Technology in Richland, Washington. Please welcome all three speakers to the stage. Welcome. I'm here today representing the Three Rivers <clears throat> Campus and the Kennewick Public Facilities District. This is the most recent aerial that we have. I'm, I apologize to the Visitor and Convention Bureau and Tridec in the Chamber that we don't have a, a more recent picture of their beautiful building which sits on the corner of the campus, but we'll get one. The Three Rivers Campus today uh, includes the Three Rivers Convention Center, the Toyota Center, and the Toyota Arena. The, the uh, Three Rivers Convention Center uh, was, the construction was finished in 2004. And we will celebrate this year the 10th anniversary of that building. And I think it looks pretty good today. They've done a great job of keeping it up. It is owned by the Kennewick Public Facilities District. Oversight management by the current board uh, with the assistance of a contract management with a company out of Iowa called Venue Works. Subsequent to the completion of the Three Rivers Convention Center in uh, 2004, the Kennewick Public Facilities District Board formed a contract arrangement with the city of Kennewick to manage the Toyota Center and the Toyota Arena. So the, the campus setting, the Three Rivers Campus, is under the management today of the Kennewick Public Facilities District. I could do 10 minutes on the great partnership between the district and the city of Kennewick and, uh, and what's going on with the Toyota Center and Toyota Arena, but we're going to confine our remarks today to the convention center. In, uh, in the past 10 years, over a million people have visited your Tri-Cities Convention Center. And I want you to know that it's a, it, while it's managed and owned by the Kennewick Public Facilities District, it is definitely a regional project. The people who attend conventions there and meetings there are not restrained in any way by invisible boundaries, nor are the people that sponsor the events that are held at the Three Rivers Convention Center. When it was built in 2004, when it was completed, there was a surplus of $2.4 million that was to be used either for uh, operating shortfalls, for expansion needs, or for depreciated items that, that required replacement. As you can see in 2000, uh, the, the column on, on the left there is what was projected over the 10 year period to be utilized from that fund to meet those deficits. And the column on, on the right is the actual numbers. And as you can see in 2006, the revenue stream turned around and based on revenues from our partners through contractual agreements and through the internal funding that comes through the convention center, we are putting money every year back into the facility. We are funding our depreciation, we are handling our expenses, and we are actually putting money into the facility. And I think it's important to note that when the facility was built, it was authorized and appropriated by the state legislature with a 0.33%, 033% sales tax award that was not a new tax. It was a, a reappropriation of existing tax, and it was available to public facilities districts who built projects that met certain benchmarks, and this one did. So while you are paying for it, uh, the bonds, it was not a new tax on the Kennewick voters or the Kennewick residents when the, the convention center was built. 
So the first challenge was, are we able to handle our growth? There are a great number of conventions uh, within the region that require an attached hotel. This is a one-year actual touch, either through the convention center or through the Tri-City Visitor and Convention Bureau of organizations that contacted us that was interested in coming to the convention center but couldn't because we didn't have an attached hotel. And there, there are a number more that looked on the website and disqualified us simply because it, it wasn't quoted on the website. So while we wouldn't have gotten all of these, I'm sure, the attached hotel component to the convention center is very important to convention planners. So what did we do about that? We looked for partners and we found one in VJ Patel. VJ Patel and a group of his partners has agreed to build a 112 unit convention hotel attached to the Three Rivers Convention Center. That uh, project is underway today. It's coming out of the ground. They're pouring floor as we speak and it will soon be done. <coughs> there is an agreement in place that it is expandable when certain occupancy benchmarks are met. So that will help our need there. The next problem is the expansion need of the facility. We are actually losing business because our facility at 75,000 square feet today is not large enough to handle many of the conventions that are being held when they have vendors, trade shows, meeting needs, and banquet needs. We, we just physically don't have the room. These are organizations that have touched the facility and said, we would love to come to you, but you are not large enough to handle us right now. So we looked at the opportunities that were available, and last year, one of the things that we hope to do as a public facilities district, when the, when, when the public facilities district was formed, they were given two-tenths of 1% sales tax authorization for enhancements providing it met an affirmative vote of the people. So we had a two-tenths that we could go out for a vote on. Along came the Regional Public Facilities District that was authorized but not appropriated. In order for them to do a project, they had to use existing authorization. And so the other public facilities districts and cities agreed that they would give up one-tenth of their existing funding authority for the Regional Public Facilities District to go out for its project, which it did in August of last year. It was not successful. So the two tenths is back on the table, and the Kenwick Public Facilities District said, we need this expansion. I'll be the first to admit we may have knee-jerked the opportunity and said, based upon the support that we feel in talking with Rotary Clubs and Kiwanis Clubs and Chambers and Service Clubs, the people will support this. And so we put up some signs, we did some <coughs> advertising, we spoke to the people we thought we needed to speak to, we put it on the ballot in November, and it was defeated. And that was the one-tenth, which would have provided approximately $20 million, to expand the convention center that would give us 100,000 square feet of usable space. And that is the drawing that we took before the voters at that time. So this is a pretty picture, and I apologize to the Port of Kennewick for using some of the port properties when we depict what the potential of the Vista Field Entertainment District could be in working with our partners, the port, the city, uh, the KID, uh, private investors, and the public, and maybe one day having something that looks like this in the Tri-Cities. I'll close my opening remarks by saying, even though we went down to defeat the Kennewick Public Facilities District in November, we are in no way backing off. That expansion, is, that expansion is needed. We feel we can enhance it. We feel we can do it in different ways. We feel given enough time that we can go out and reach the people door to door, as Toby says, and, 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 and enlist on them to join us in expanding the Kennewick Public Facilities District Three Rivers campus. 
So that's where we are today. And at the conclusion of the other remarks, be happy to answer any questions. Hi, uh, I'm Fred Robb, uh, president of the Richland Public Facilities District. So I'll make some brief comments about the status of our public facilities district. <clears throat> it was founded, uh, chartered by the city of Richland in July 2002 to design, build, and operate a regional facility, which has become the Hanford Reach Interpretive Center, uh, also known as the Reach. Uh, it was intended to be, uh, when we adopted this, it was intended to be the successor to Crest, but with expanded scope, uh, serve as the gateway to the Hanford Reach National Monument, uh, serve as the gateway to a future Manhattan Project National Park and be a regional center as part of the complex uh, called the Ice Age Floods National Geographic Trail. The facility uh, is under construction and will open soon, uh, centrally located at Columbia Park West, central to the Tri-Cities. It's about as far <coughs> central as Richland gets. Uh, 14,000 square feet of finished space in the facility, plus a 10,000 square foot basement. Very importantly, uh, the uh, design uh, process, the design build uh, award process, uh, emphasized that the facility needed to be optimized for flexibility and expandability as the Tri-City grows. We know from outside surveys that we should be prepared to serve at least an audience of 60,000 visitors a year uh, by comparison with what other museums do. And this would be the lowest ratio, if we achieve that, it would be the lowest ratio of visitors to population size. Uh, and so uh, we know that this is a small facility, but it's a first phase of the facility. Uh, and our mission is we intend to be the go-to and connector facility for people who want to learn about the forces of nature and man that shaped the mid-Columbia region. And so uh, we will not do all things, but we will hook people up with people who do all things. Uh, so that visitors coming into the center, uh, coming into the Tri-Cities, this would be a first place to visit, or people living in the Tri-Cities who don't quite know how to get connected <coughs> with, uh, you know, river tours on the Columbia or various events like that. So this is uh, a map that's uh, unreadable from your distance, but we only want to look at some of the high level uh, pieces of it. If you look at the part to the left, that's the actual finished floor space as we have it. So the challenge in building a museum is museum galleries want to be black boxes. And so how do you make an interesting building out of black boxes? I think uh, our architect uh, engineering firm has done a very nice job of that. Uh, what you see on the, so supposedly we have no laser. Oh, we do have a laser. Okay, what you see over here is uh, one of the galleries, uh, this one is Gallery 1. It will uh, tell the story of the natural history of the region uh, in Gallery 1. And those uh, exhibits are uh, currently getting ready to be installed. Uh, this is Gallery 2. This is meant to be a visiting gallery. And the first uh, part of its uh, visiting exhibits will be uh, an exhibit on the Manhattan Project. Uh, the central area, including DVD rooms, et cetera, is called the Great Hall, uh, and that's the central area over here. Uh, and then uh, this is the fairly large basement facility, which will uh, be unfinished uh, as of the beginning. We hope to get into the curation business uh, using this part of the facility. Uh, instead of trying to Squint your eyes at this. Let's advance to the next slide. There we go. Uh, here's the future expansion of the facility. So what we're looking at here uh, is the facility as we're going to build it in the initial phase. And then you'll see that the plan included up to an additional four galleries that could be added as funding uh, is raised to proceed with those galleries. 
And so uh, basically by finishing out gallery by gallery while the museum operates, they're all set up so that there's uh, a minimal penetration into the main part of the building. So you can build these add-on galleries and basically when the construction is done and you're ready, you break through the wall, uh, close down for a week, break through the wall and you've got a new gallery uh, up. <coughs> what we uh, can do with that scheme is expand the 14,000 square feet of upstairs space to 28,000 square feet in stages as the funds become available. And uh, the expansion plan also includes an expansion of the basement from 10,000 square feet to 14,000 square feet. So that's, that, that's the plan. Uh, this is the reality. This is pictures taken uh, on uh, 15th of March. Uh, so the siting, uh, if you go into on Columbia Park Trail into uh, Columbia Park, Columbia Park Trail uh, on the side where I would be uh, taking the picture. Uh, you're just in front of the marina area, uh, actually uh, just uh, past the parking lot uh, by the marina, looking at the uh, bluff here. Uh, and so this is the back of the building, uh, but uh, the river uh, facing part. Uh, this is the reach viewed from the side now as you walk around to the entryway. Uh, there'll be a, uh, a, a multi-hundred seat amphitheater stage in this area. You can see some of the rock work and a little bit of the outline of the concrete pad for the stage. Uh, and then uh, I didn't show the front of the building because it, was, it just had its first coat of mud on the front, so it wasn't too picturesque. Uh, but here's the view from the top of that uh, walk up uh, from the marina area, and it shows the patio area. Uh, in front of the facility, and uh, here is the sun stage uh, that was designed by the, uh, our STEM kids uh, in, in the STEAM program. Uh, they, they did the design for this. This will be the sun as part of a solar system exhibit incorporating all of the Tri-Cities. Uh, and so that's basically the outside of the building. Uh, inside uh, was being painted last weekend when I was there. Uh, and so things are coming along. So what are the milestones for 2014? Uh, complete the site infrastructure and the initial building construction. Uh, what we call phase one was the site infrastructure, phase two is the initial building, and then proceed to start planning phases three, four, five, and six. Uh, exhibit installation uh, will be ongoing uh, in a few weeks. Uh, Crest, which was operated uh, previously by the Environmental Science and Technology uh, <coughs> Foundation, has now been merged into the REACH. Uh, we're clearing up the last details there. Uh, members of the Hanford REACH Interpretive Center, 501c3, the REACH Capital Campaign Steering Committee, and the Environmental Science and Technology Foundation, uh, those memberships are now merged into a single foundation supporting the REACH. And the Richland Public Facility uh, will sign a quid pro quo contract with them on April 7th at our public meeting. Uh, the REACH grand opening is scheduled for July 2014. Uh, then the next step is to grow a sustainable and scalable business as the education and connection hub that serves the community and visitors to the Tri-Cities. So we have... Uh, ample reserves uh, put in place to help back up uh, building that business and uh, we will spend uh, only if we have the money at hand uh, and then we plan for a further development to fulfill the needs of a growing metropolitan center. I'm done. <laughs> What I think is critically important is, and I'm going to go very as brief as possible, I'm hoping we have a chance to involve people to talk and ask us questions or share your opinions, because I think this is the room that's important. The, what you have is a chronology of a facility that has done stupendously well. Uh, the Kennewick Convention Center is great. I would also note, too, that I'm wearing my PASCO hat. PASCO pa Public Facilities District has been involved with funding with that to a small extent. So the PASCO PFD is active in managing that part of it. And, and But I think the 
want, the panel today I think shows something that's completed, something that's about to be completed, which is critically important. And I would show you a picture of a facility, but we don't have one for the Tri-Cities Public Facilities District. That there's an important thing that because the voters didn't uh, said no. We have two PFDs that have used existing money to fund very well uh, uh, facilities. The follow on to that, if we go back about six, seven years ago, the question came up and I think as a follow on to some popular projects, whether or not the Tri-Cities needs to think about Tri-City regional facilities that an individual city could not afford for itself. The cities actually did get together and agreed we should, uh, we should form a combined unit. We thought public facilities district would be the best way to go. And some of the projects that were cons uh, considered, this is a large list of things that this Tri-Cities does need in the next 50 or 100 years. Four rows up to the top, we shortlisted to either an aquatics facility, performing arts center, possible additional reach funding or expansion of the convention center. The Public Facilities District, Tri-Cities, one did uh, agree that we should go after a regional aquatic center. So we worked for a period of time to come up with a package that the public would support that would be a world-class facility. Uh, all of those details, and I'm sure that you all remember because everybody in this room, almost everybody, probably had the opportunity to vote on that. We had a Tri-Cities vote on it in August. It didn't ultimately pass. Uh, and it was about a 57-43 uh, 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 didn't, didn't pass. There is a list of reasons, and we've gone through and done a bit of an analysis uh, of some of the reasons. There isn't any one single reason it didn't pass. Uh, I think if you look, there generally are going to be the top items are going to be the reasons that they didn't. Uh, I think if you did change any one of these, they still wouldn't have passed. The question, though, is the demand is still there. How does this community move forward to do additional projects? I know, for example, and laud the uh, performing arts community has uh, said we're going to move forward and do something possibly as a public-private partnership. I think that's a an excellent uh, opportunity. Mechanisms that are government-based, though, uh, we have uh, we have chose a public facilities <coughs> district as a way, but there are other ways on the list. Uh, each one, though, has issues. We had, for example, the PFD. We had to go to the state legislature to get law changed. Tri Cities is the only place that you can have a public facilities district that encompasses other public facilities districts. There's some strings attached with that, uh, but I think if you look at it, w voting on something in August, even if that didn't pass, there's the demand is still there. If some things change, the national economy and a variety of other things. The PFD, along with checking in with the cities, the structure we have decided to preserve, we're not actively pursuing putting something on a ballot because it does cost money and uh, time. We don't think we need to change these conditions before something the Tri-Cities will consider approving. By way of that, I guess that's a larger question is, and something I've been struggling with personally is, is that the right way to go? Is there something else that we are missing or we of the community can rally behind to get something done? At the same time that we also know that some people don't like taxes. There is no such thing as a free lunch, uh, but it will this community support coming together in something and building something that's responsible, financially sustainable, and then add to that bottom line? I think John's note about the lost opportunity for and financial impact I think a lot of people understand the basics that the ledgers of these things will never pencil out to be in the black if they were private sector would do them the question is if you go build a 35 million dollar aquatics facility will that benefit other parts of the community in other tangible and intangible ways the heads and beds certainly you know with visitor convention bureau that sort of thing will the community benefit from that how should we proceed? And with that, I think I'd like to ask that if we can go have, ask questions, or have the people in the audience might want to make observations <coughs> or ask questions. We have a portable microphone. Thank you. And I would just ask that we make sure that one person that I want to, want to include, uh, Kirk Williamson, if you want to ask or talk, I wanted to, would want to make sure he's included. Regarding yes, the convention center, uh, those of us who attend weekend events when there's 
two or more events at the same time? No, there's inadequate parking. When are you going to build the multi-story parking garage? A multi-story parking garage is in the planning stage. It's all about funding. And we recognize that there is a shortfall uh, of parking, and it, and it, it even is going to get uh, more impacted when we have the hotel in place. And, and so it, it's all about how do we fund it. I actually you probably need two, uh, one southerly and the other one northerly with covered access to the convention center and the Toyota center. So you might think about that in your planning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, congratulations uh, to the two local PFDs on what you have accomplished so far. But it occurs to me that the Tri-Cities may be the only place, at least in the Northwest, that could create four separate competing entities to accomplish one thing, which is a uh, group of public facilities. And the voters seem to have been pretty clear about that subject. Uh, in the last election cycle when in the middle of the regional PFD campaign uh, the Kennewick Public Facility District found it necessary to announce that it was going on the next ballot uh, to those some of those same voters for that. Um, how do you address that or do you plan to address it or is it addressable? I'll take a step. So going back about seven or eight years when I, start, I first started to get involved with it, the question I think is, what's the art of the possible? Kennewick Public Facilities District had a going concern. Richland was moving in the, in the direction to finish the reach. After a lot of discussion in the pre-PFD, it was called a, a committee, it was decided <clears throat> that it would be this point going forward. I don't think we had the ability, and I'm not sure there even still is the will, to consider a single public facilities district and all the attendant details. I guess the question for you, I think you, Kirk, would be a big fan of that. I've floated that and, and asked that question, and I've not gotten a lot of resonance on the idea of a singular PFD. Kirk, uh, I'll speak for the Kenwick Public Facilities District. Uh, we have a need on hand. We have a need to expand the convention center. We have a, a need to see if we can work with the performing arts group and bring something meaningful to the campus that will help not only the community enjoy quality of life, but will continue to bring new dollars, new tourist dollars into the area that were not there when that day began and circulate when that person goes home. The Kennewick Public Facilities District project at the Convention Center is self-funding from the standpoint of the tax and the partnerships that are in place today. But as we continue to lose to the cities like Spokane and Vancouver that are enlarging their facilities within our competition realm, uh, we, we will not continue to have that out-of-town business pouring in and we'll be reliant on the local businesses and the local functions to meet our funding needs and that's not what the facility was built for. The facility was built to bring new dollars into the community. So as a, as a local PFD, we have a project that requires funding and an absent other options, and we're certainly willing to look at any potential other options, then we have to find a way within ourselves, our community, the region, the region, our partners, in finding a way to get that funded. And, and when you're looking at tax, obviously we're, we're reliant on the tax within the district boundaries. We, Today, we can't go outside the district boundaries for that PFD. But the, but the project is needed. It, uh, we'll, we can use all the help that someone is willing to give us in figuring out a way to do it. We think the way to do it, 
and the way that we're moving forward with right now, and I'm talking about the Kennewick Public Facilities District, is to bring forth a project that the Kennewick voters will support at one-tenth or two-tenths. And that means we're going to have to go, we're going to have to bring in private parties to run a campaign and do it like major campaigns are handled. We're going to have to provide a project that we can go door to door and enlist any number of partners, not just the service clubs, but business partners, community partners, with people like the task force and arts task force and other organizations trumping for us on a door to door basis and hope we can get that support. That's the only plan that we have in place right now. Yeah, if I could make a comment, I, I joined the uh, regional PFD about a year and a half ago. And, you know, at that time, there was a train uh, going down the track, and I got on it. And, and, and the direction of the train was to come up with a public work to uh, take on as a project and complete. So, you know, that train uh, got derailed. Uh, in the ballot uh, area, and so, you know, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how is the best way to go forward. Uh, an idea I introduced at the last meeting, which I'd like to flesh out more, is that I think what we really need to do as a PFD, first of all, I think uh, it's probably incumbent on us to cool our heels a little bit uh, and not try to rush into another election uh, ballot, but I think uh, what makes sense is to try to build a roadmap that is somewhat comprehensive and has, you know, uh, a lot of roles for the community to be involved in, but says, what are these major facilities that we need to develop in the next 20 to 30 years, realizing that the Tri-Cities is growing? Uh, one of the unfortunate aspects, I think, about the way the law is written for the, the uh, public facilities districts in general, not, not the specific one for the regional, but for all of them, is it tends to sort of push you in the direction of adopting one grand project. Uh, and, uh, you know, you don't even have discretion of how much tax to raise. It's either 0.1% or 0.2%. 2%, right? And it's written that you should build something with it. Uh, that's a regional facility. You know, the wording is a regional facility. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's bad reasoning. I, I think a more sensible approach is you make a road map. Uh, you have a lot of team players, and I think each of the public facilities districts could be a team player, and, and you basically Look at the roadmap, you say what's doable, who are the partners that should be involved, and who are gonna take the lead for different things? And what are the sources of money? You know, Some of them may be more appropriate mm -hmm. to uh, being paid for principally with public money. You know, an aquatic center is sort of like a park or you know, a pool or something. It's, it's not traditional to buy these with private support. Something like the REACH, we've benefited tremendously from generosity of individuals and corporations in the Tri-Cities area, uh, heavily invested in that, and relatively small fraction of public money invested in it. It's significant, but uh, it's only a piece of it. We've been able to get grants uh, that uh, you know, we're able to cash in uh, to help do that. And, and so, you know, that, that's particular to the type of business we decided to get into. It's very different from what the Kennewick facility can tap into. It's very different from what an aquatic center should do. And I think a more sensible thing than to be driven by the way the law is written is actually to say what makes sense in a long-term vision and then try to translate that into the pieces. I agree. You know, I, I, again, unfortunately, when the law was written the way it was when the regional public facilities district came into being, it, as Fred said, it forced almost, while there was cooperation with the cities and with the public facilities district, it forced districts that had funding authority in place, granted 
when the structures were, were built uh, with a vote of the people uh, to say, all right, what are our future needs for the projects on hand? And are we willing, does it make sense to give up a component of that funding for another project when there is no guarantee that the projects you have in hand will be funded when the need comes. And, and, and that's the problem that we have today, or one of the problems that we have today. I think also you have to remember that the, uh, you do, you know, the, the state, the cards in your hand are you do have these public facilities districts, and they individually have obligations that, you know, their boards have spent years trying to figure out how to do and gotten, in some cases, uh, and I'm patting uh, John on the back, very, very good at operating. Uh, you know, if we were, for instance, to merge the Kennewick Facilities District into some grand district, I think that'd be foolish uh, because you have a group that's very good at running the convention center. Uh, you know, adding, adding uh, me or Matt or, you know, uh, our successors to that, I think, would add confusion rather than uh, light. And so I, I think it is the facts. However, I think uh, in, a, in a larger plan, one could imagine that each of these groups has distinct strengths of doing certain things, and they could be tapped to lay their resources in in ways that make sense. I'm probably a regional guy, so this is for your thing. And it just is, when you looked at how it lost, you built your pool, you, you proposed your pool on the Pasco side, which in fact would pass on that side. Had you put a performing arts center on the Kennewick Richland side up in the with you guys, it would have passed on both sides. So when we look at, a, when you look at a regional project, you need to appeal to the region. And yes, we have a river running through there, and you need to kind of get over it and realize you need to offer something on both sides if you're going to do a regional project. I, I guess I'd note, when we went through and deciding whether or not to do a performing arts center or an aquatics facility on a ballot, the two were the standouts compared to the others. They were, they were in a bracket together. And certainly, I think performing arts center was probably a little bit more popular in Richland. It wasn't Kennewick, it wasn't Pasco. Aquatic Center had tended to have more broad appeal. Location is, I guess, that's always hindsight is 2020. I would note in particular on the aquatics facility, or excuse me, performing arts facility, the operational shortfalls in our projections were far, far different picture than an aquatics facility. And so I think the, the capital costs and operational costs on that one are, are gonna be tougher to pencil out and that was, I think, a, a, an item of discussion at the last meeting is we as the people on the PFDs, I think, have done a dutiful job at making sure that any proposal that might be put forth before the voters is tenable and doable. But at the same time, whether or not the PFDs, which principally are council members, uh, there are some PFD members that have a, another job as a council member, then usually also another job, full-time day job, is that the right mix? or does the PFD need to enlist, and I, I don't know if Eric is still here, but if we had about 25 Eric Van Winkles, it, that's a pitch, and once you're done with the carousel project, you wanna get involved in this, uh, and, and, that, and that group, um, do we need a, do, a group of do it and get it doneers to balance out that responsible part about putting something on the ballot? I think that there is possibility with a route like that, of finding that right, denominator. It isn't just PFD people going out to rotary meetings and to uh, chamber meetings. There's another element of this community we did not reach that we do need to reach. And so that's the question I think I'm, I think we should be in, and I'm wrestling with. Hi, I'm Wes Dorr and uh, direct this question to John. I know the first speaker, the first question you had was on the, the uh, parking. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about too. I'm so concerned with that parking. I've seen it filled up, and we and we haven't even expanded the building. And when it's expanded, are you thinking of put, making it two or three stories garage? And if so, tell the people that and get the money for that as you do, because that's so important. I think that that means a lot. I just wanted to stress that that the importance of that. Thank you. 
Wes, I've learned two things since being on the Kennewick Public Facilities Board about parking. One is that people in the Tri-Cities don't like to pay for parking. <laughs> Two is that parking structures are very expensive and they return very little on the original investment. So <laughs> while parking is, is definitely a concern. And you know, there are larger areas where people bus and they, you know, they, they park off site and, and they provide transportation. There are a number of different things that we're looking at right now, I, I think, and we certainly need to expand the campus. Yeah. That, absolutely. I, I don't know how you can expand without going up, and so two or three floors, I think people would pay for it if they, if they had to. I think it's a very necessary concern. Thank you. Thank you, John. You're welcome, Wes. And, and I see our hosts are, and by the way, I want to thank our hosts for providing this venue for this discussion. I think there's probably a lot of unasked questions we're certainly available. You can get email, phone, uh, talk to us afterwards. I point out again that I think we're interested in the question, where should the Tri-Cities proceed? And I th would like to think that's universal amongst all the public facilities districts and cities. Well, it's interesting to note that while we are in some cases competitive, the three of us sit on the Tri-Cities Regional uh, Board, and so we're very cooperative in that effort when it comes to working together. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Matt Watkins, John Givens, and Dr. Fred Robb, thank you so very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you and your staff for your hard work and your important role that uh, your organization plays in uh, developing public facilities in the Tri-Cities area. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Excuse me while I put this microphone back. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Bowton Construction for sponsoring our luncheon today. Thank you very much. And thank you also to our friends at Charter and uh, uh, Richland City View for recording today's meeting, uh, which will be rebroadcast on both channels. Um, also, I'd like to thank the staff here at the Red Lion Inn. Thank you very much for uh, hosting us today. Did a fine job for us. Thank you. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we adjourn, I just have a few quick announcements. I'll make it quick. Uh, I'd like to remind you of our annual meeting and awards luncheon on April 30th uh, at the Three Rivers Convention Center, which we were just talking about. Uh, we <laughs> get there early so you can find parking. Ha, ha, ha. We hope you can join us in celebrating the accomplishments of the regional chamber members and the entrepreneurial spirit. Eight awards, including the Business on a Roll, will be presented uh, that day, and the Business on a Roll Award will recognize businesses that have achieved success during the 2013 year. The Chamber will be accepting nominations for the Business on a Roll Awards through this Friday, which is March 28th. If you'd like to nominate your own or a fellow Chamber member business, please pick up a uh, application there at the back of the, the room. And lastly, uh, register today for the Chamber's next business, Development University, which is Legal Mysteries Decoded setting your business up for success. The Business Development University is being held uh, March 27th, tomorrow, and there, are, uh, there is room, so there's flyers back here as well for that. And now, I'd like to bring Kim up here for our door prizes. Kim? Kim Van Warmer. Hi, everybody. Today we have eight items to give away. Um, the first one is donated by um, Mezzo Thai Fusion. It's a $50 gift certificate. And it goes to Tracy Wagner with KNDU NBC right now. Hey. Next one is also a $50 gift certificate from uh, Mezzo Thai, but it's for the Tapas restaurant. And this one is Columbia Bank, and it is Amy Hart. Ooh. Next, we have a $25 gift card for Tony Romas that was donated from Payne West. This goes to the Mid Columbia Libraries. Um, it is um, Sharami Freeman. Next, we have another $25 Tony Romas card, again, donated by Payne West. And this one is to, oh, where's the card at? 
Um, it's for Advocare, and who says this one? I can't read it. <laughs> Bob and Jeanette Ray. We've got um, some beautiful flowers that are donated from Just Roses. And that goes to Patty Jansen Key for the hey. Community First Bank. <laughs> Lastly, we have, um, well, we have three bottles of wine. Two were donated by Hedges. One goes to another Community First member. Um, and that is going to be Jamie Ar Arriva Arrivato. Thank you. I'm going to mix them up a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> uh, another bottle of wine is to Washington Trust Bank, and it is Robert Nesbitt. Nesbitt? <laughs> and lastly, our bottle of wine from um, Barnard Griffin goes to. Colonial Life, and it is um, Luann Davis. Thank you, everybody. If you're interested in donating in a, a door prize for next month, just give me an email or a call. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. And just one last thing. Uh, thank you for attending today's luncheon. And it's remember, it's always good business to do business with chamber members. Have a great day.